if you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. Yeah, we can definitely do that, or we could be better clinicians and use our ultrasound. Hello, my name is Jacob Avila of the Ultrasound Podcast, and I have with me our co-host, one of the founders, actually, of the Ultrasound Podcast, Michael Mallon. What's up, dude? Hey, man, how you doing? What? Well, I just didn't want to say, like, a co-host <laughs> as in, like, like I don't know. Like, this you new guy this you picked when up I was, the, like, in this... diapers, basically, and then I just kind of, like, I cheated and tricked my way into the podcast, so I, I didn't know how to, like, Some, like, new that. guy that we, we found on the street, and we're like, <laughs> hey, man, you want to come do a little podcast with us? We called the Ultrasound Podcast. Uh <laughs> I think that's thanks. how it happened. I, I want to say thanks for having me on today, Jacob. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there's this thing. I don't know if you've heard of it, Mike, but there's this virus that's going around that is everywhere. And we've been talking about it. Everybody's been talking about it, but we've had a few episodes on the podcast about it um, and some videos, including a two-part interview with an Italian physician, Marco Garone, who is on the front lines in Italy. Definitely follow him on Twitter. He's got some amazing tips and pearls, not even just about ultrasound, but just managing these patients in general. We did an ultrasound of the week. Um, we did a five minute sono on how to identify a viral pneumonia. And we even did an ultrasound gel podcast where we discussed the two articles that had been published on ultrasound and COVID at that time. And if you're one of our listeners who has been paying attention to all of these things that we've been publishing about COVID, you might get the impression that maybe we're pro ultrasound. <laughs> so uh, I think that I, I think we should kind of step step back for a minute, Jacob, and and really just honestly talk about the fact that um, ultrasound generally is very low risk, right? It's one of those things where you know we think about the major risk from ultrasound being associated with making um, a a misinformed decision, uh, making an inaccurate diagnosis, um, maybe even you know missing a diagnosis because you don't know how to perform the ultrasound well enough. We don't often think about actually causing harm with our ultrasound probe very often. And I thought that what you brought up in that uh, MRAP episode, the one that came out on the 27th with Swami, about the concept of not hurting our patients with the ultrasound probe was really good because realistically, now all of a the sudden, there are these, these viral particles that we could be potentially transmitting from patient to patient or from patient to ourselves, which is obviously not cool. So I feel like all of a sudden things have changed a bit. Yeah, you're totally right. I mean, you guys probably have like a complicated, like not complicated, but a, a class where you had to take, where you had to learn how to do the donning and the doffing like we did. And I, and I know that the first time I took the class, it was just like a little bit intimidating. It's like, oh my God, like, what am I supposed to do? Like, how do I ensure that I'm not spreading this disease more than it's already being spread? And you finally figure that out. And then you have to add, you know, the ultrasound, how to make sure that the ultrasound stays clean. And now that's not a potential fomite or a nidus of infection. That can be a, a little bit tricky, but it's super important. We definitely don't want the ultrasound be associated with harm. Yeah, certainly. I mean, you know, one thing to think about is these are definitely not cases where you want to be bringing in a medical student um, or if there if they're any left in your hospital or even a resident for that matter, if if they're not familiar with and can't make the can't make the determination on their own. I mean, really, the, these are not educational scans. Uh, we don't want to be performing them just for the heck of it. You know, I mean, we want to make sure that we're actually clinically using this information and that it's actually answering a question because otherwise it's a it's an unneeded risk that we don't need to be exposing people too. I mean, at the same time, you know, in our hospital and other hospitals, we've even been throwing around the idea of, all right, can we actually use ultrasound to save PPE? Like, for example, can you use ultrasound instead of that, that post intubation chest x-ray, right? Or can you use it instead of that, that post central line chest x-ray? Because that, you know, that x-ray tech is going to have to put on Don and off PPE. So you're potentially losing or saving PPE because of that. So all of a sudden now we're thinking about sort of, you know, what are the downstream effects of using ultrasound during these cases? And then, and then of course, there's the, the concept of actually cleaning the machine. Jacob, what are you currently doing to, to clean the machine? So at the time of this recording, that's the uh, 28th of March, a couple of days ago, the ASEP ultrasound section actually posted a proposed algorithm. Um, I took that talk with our infectious disease people uh, where we where I work, um, talk with a couple other people online and kind of came up with this kind of flow. And this is not like this is just me trying to figure it out. So if you guys listening and you Mike, have any suggestions, any other ways to make it better, I'm all ears. But here it is so far. 
So you're going to don your equipment the same way that you would um, normally yourself. Now, if you have a patient that is high risk for transmission, so let's say that they're intubated, there's uh, aerosolizing procedure, something like that. I'd suggest actually using one of those sterile ultrasound sheets and actually putting it over the transducer. If you have someone that's suspected or you're not 100% sure, maybe don't use the transducer sheath cover just to kind of save resources. But let's say you go in there, you do the whole scan, you're done. Before you leave the room, so you're still fully in your PPE, take the gray top wipes and clean the entire thing. So I'm talking screen, all the probes, the base, the wheels, clean everything everything off of that machine. Oh, and I forgot to mention, make sure you take everything off of the machine except for gray top wipes and sterile ultrasound gel packets. So those little packs, because you know, that ultrasound bottle, um, that could actually be infected. You know, if you like tap on accident, you know, tap the transducer with oh, yeah. the probe bottle, yeah, now the whole probe is going to be messed up. Multiple right? previous studies on MRSA and pseudomonas in those bottles. So that's, yeah, no, those things aren't good for, for, for the situation right now. Agreed. So no gauze, no IV tubing, nothing is on the machine, right? So you've cleaned the entire machine, wheel the thing out of the room and put it right next to your doffing pad. We have these little pads that are like our doffing pads. Wheel it there, take off your uh, PPE at that point with your normal doffing procedure, then clean the whole machine a second time. So it's actually two cleanings, one in the room and one outside of the room. And the thought is, is that that would probably take your risk of infection, you know, from maybe 1%, I'm making up numbers here, from like 1% down to like 0.5% with that second cleaning, which I think is, you know, it's a good relative risk reduction, even though the absolute risk reduction is like that high. The, 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 the relative risk reduction is good for the numbers that you made up. That's correct. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, right, exactly. So potentially you, you're cleaning it in the room between when you clean it inside the room to bringing it outside the room, potentially some of the airborne part particles could have gotten on the machine. So that's the theory for doing the cleaning twice. So question. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I got a question. So are you doing this, for example, with the the rest of the initial evaluation of the patient, like a lot of the a lot of the shops that I've I've talked with or have friends who are you know in the thick of it right now, they're they're very much minimizing exposure to these patients. So single you know interview, physical exam, you know get the labs at the same time, and then often a lot of them are communicating by telemedicine afterwards or just sort of talking through the door to them, like for one follow up basically. Unless they're, obviously if they're sick, there's more interaction. But if it's a sort of you know what's your initial evaluation? Let's you know get an oxygen sat and a chest X ray, maybe do an ultrasound. So are you combining the ultrasound experience with that as well? Yeah, absolutely. And to be honest, that's actually how I usually utilize ultrasound in my daily practice yeah. is I'm not like doing my history, my physical exam, like going yeah. back to my desk and yeah. then grabbing the ultrasound You're machine and then taking it into the room. Like right. On my initial evaluation, if I think ultrasound is going to be useful, I'm bringing it into the room. Yeah, you're you're rolling it in with you based on chief complaint, basically. So it's like you know, absolutely vaginal bleeding, and the ultrasound's coming in with you, or right up the quadrant pain, the yeah, ultrasound's right. coming in with you, all that stuff, right? Yeah, that makes sense. So yeah, 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 one of the thing that I've heard is that some people, I guess, and this is you know probably only in really endemic areas right now, but where they've basically just taken the, one of their machines and said, "This is our dirty machine." We're going to, you know, let this one be dirty, clean it. I mean, we're going to clean it between patients, but we're not going to get crazy about it. Like, cause we're not going to move it between potential COVID patients and not and patients that are unlikely to be COVID. Have, have you guys thought about doing that at all? Yeah, we've thought about it and it definitely is something that we are considering and that I think if you have machines, if you have enough machines in your department where you can utilize just one to be the COVID machine, I think that would be a great idea. Um, and you're doing the same technique for cleaning, by the way. It's just if you just have those that machine just for that, if there's that, you know, small chance that that actually has infection in it, you're and this is all theoretical, you are you know, only using that patients that already potentially have it or have a confirmed disease. So right. it's, it would be safer. So you don't accidentally give it to somebody else. So you're doing like an interscaling block for shoulder reduction, for instance. S certainly. Yeah. So, and, you know, a couple of thoughts. Um, I, I like the idea that you're double cleaning it. I think that's probably the safest at some point we might have to talk about, is that, uh, is that worthwhile in terms of, you know, cleaning supplies? Because eventually those might as well uh, be a problem, just like PPEs are. 
Um, I have heard of other people doing things so they can minimize cleaning. Like for example, putting like a sterile sheath over the ultrasound machine uh, itself. I saw somebody tweeted it when it was, it maybe Pratt's who basically had like a, just a giant sheath, like over the ultrasound machine. So that basically you're just like touching the machine through the plastic. Basically that's, that's kind of a cool idea. Then you can clean the plastic as opposed to the machine, especially if you've got like a dedicated machine. And then I've also heard about people using, um, basically handheld machines and putting them in inside of a probe cover and leaving them there for the entire shift and then just cleaning the probe cover between patients, which is kind of a cool idea as well. Cause especially if you're using your cell phone for your butterfly right. or for your lumify, like you don't necessarily want to like be using that thing and then take it home. Right. Like I certainly wouldn't. Um, so yeah, I thought the, I think right. the sheath is kind of a cool idea too. Yeah. And what I've actually, I don't know if he was like the first one that kind of talked about it, but I saw a tweet by uh, Peter Weimersheimer, who's on the podcast fairly frequently, um, where, so what he does is he sticks the probe in, uh, the sheath and then the, um, end of the sheath, he ties the rubber band there. And then most of these ultrasound, I've never seen one not come with two rubber bands. So most of them, as far as I know, come with two rubber bands, the second rubber band, he's using it to basically tie off the, uh, open end. So it's essentially like a closed system. And he's like, you know, using a phone inside the sheath. And as far as I know, he's, he's taking off the sheath for every single like new patient. He's not like reusing the sheath, but mm -hmm. if you're okay. in a resource limited setting, maybe you will have to clean the sheath itself and just kind of like have that as the ultrasound machine. But I mean, it's definitely an option. I've thought I've, about doing I've it with the sheath and, and just cause we've got a tent, right? So just thought yeah. about like taking that probe out in, in the, in the uh, handheld device and the sheath and leaving it out there for the shift and, you know, basically yeah. cleaning the sheath. I'm not, I heard the same thing from stone. So I don't know if it's the Weimersheimer technique or the stone technique, but we need to figure it out Probably because they both sound great. We got to figure out which one we're going to go with. I think we should call it the Malin Avila technique. <laughs> Cause we're the first to talk, not the first to talk about it. <laughs> it doesn't matter. We're yeah. going to take it. It's ours okay. now. I like it. Um, how, so one of the things you kind of mentioned it about like basically putting a sheath over the entire machine. I've seen that, but I'm unclear. Like, where do you get a sheath for the whole machine? Like we're talking about the cart based machine, plastic trash bag. I mean like, a what plastic trash bag. It's like a clear plastic trash bag. Yeah. I mean, like most of the trash, I mean, I don't know about your hospital, but most of the plastic trash, most of the trash bags in my hospital are clear, relatively clear. Yeah. Right. And you just basically stick that over it. Um, I, I, I imagine there's probably something in like surgical processing you could use as well, but I haven't really looked into it to be honest. I, I kind of like the, I don't really like the giant bag over my machine thing as much just because I think it's going to hurt your ability to see the screen. Um, I'm a bigger yeah. fan of like, let's just dedicate a machine to this process and, you know, clean it best we can kind of like you're talking about, uh, but still be able to use it functionally. Yeah. No, I, and that's kind of where I'm at. Now we'll say that we have um, an M9, a Mindray M9, which has a physical keyboard on it. We are trying to not use that machine on COVID patients because it's very difficult to clean that. Whereas our TE7, which is a completely tablet-based system, that's what we're using specifically on our COVID patients because it's significantly easier to clean. So yeah, times, wherever listeners, yep. or wherever you have a machine and you're thinking about making one for COVID patients, use the one that is the easiest to clean. Yeah, totally agree with that. I think that makes total sense. And that's actually one reason I really like the handheld devices because I feel like they are a little bit easier to clean. There's just less crevices. There's less stuff to clean. Like you're talking about cleaning wheels, <laughs> you know, like, right. I'm a little busy. Yeah. I don't really have time to like, clean the wheels on the ultrasound machine. So if I can just like yeah. take a tablet and just wipe it down, you know, real good with a, with a cancer wipe, I feel like that's probably a better, a, a, like a simpler way to go about it. So I, I'm a big fan of the tablets right now, personally. Yeah, agreed. And then um, uh, the last thing I want to mention, and this is with any cleaning uh, thing that you have. Um, now we're not, I don't really know what the brand name is of it, to be honest. I just know we have gray tops and we have purple tops. And the gray tops are the ones that most manufacturers suggest using because it's less harsh. And the gray tops actually have been shown to be effective, or at least have been reported to be effective against viruses such as COVID. Remember that they actually have to have a three minute dwell time. So for them to be effective, they have to, you can't like clean it. And then 30 seconds later, you are already scanning another patient, right? Although I will say if you clean it before you doff, it probably takes me a full three minutes to doff, right? So it's by the time I'm done doffing, it's been the three minutes and then I can clean it that second time. Yeah. Exposure matters. Uh, and actually I got a pretty good tip from actually also from Peter Weimersheimer. Um, maybe he should have been on this podcast. <laughs> and it was uh, basically to take the wipe and, and basically put it on top of the probe and just let it sit there. 
while you're doing your other stuff, right? So it just the, basically the wipe sits on the probe. It's exposing the probe to you know all the the cancer fighting juices, <laughs> and and then basically you know for as long as you can, maybe it's one or two or maybe right. even three minutes, and then you wipe it down and you let it dry off. And you're also right, just like with iodine, for example, when for a surgical procedure, it's got to dry before things are clean, right? Like it's not just like, you know, you can't wipe it on, wipe it off and you're good to go. It's wipe it on, let it dry. And then you can, and then you can think about moving on. And like you mentioned, three minutes is the magic number. Yeah. Agreed. Well, again, ultrasound, we think it's very useful. And if you want to know more about it, just go to the core ultrasound website where we have um, all of our uh, COVID podcasts as the last uh, post on there. But for this one, remember, clean your machine, make sure that you have a protocol in place that your hospital is okay with for using this on these patients. Yep. And only use it if you feel like you're really going to need it or if you feel like it's beneficial. Thanks, Jacob. Thank you. As usual, that was a super fun podcast. Now, we talked about the donning and doffing and how you integrate ultrasound cleaning into it. If you go to our Instagram at Core Ultrasound, you'll see an example of how we do it. That's courtesy of Rebecca Teague, one of my phenomenal residents. And if you're interested in an online ultrasound fellowship, check out ultrasoundleadershipacademy.com.